once you've gone through that and you know how hard it is, maybe you get better. Then you look at the people around you who they're just starting and you, you can actually feel like, ah, I know what you're going through, man. I went through that myself. So I've always been intrigued by learning books. It's obviously a big reason why uh, One Huddle is where it is today, but also the, the field of cognitive behavior and neuroscience and uh, learning science has constantly been uh, you know, coming out with some really cool stuff over the last bunch of years. And uh, in my most recent tour of the local bookstore, I, I came across this book called Beginners. The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning. And what caught my attention wasn't so much the title, uh, but it was, uh, you know, on the uh, inside cover, hearing the fact that this gentleman named Tom Vanderbilt, just so happens to be our next guest, uh, decided to embark on a journey to understand what it's like to be a beginner again. And in the back cover of his book, he says this, why do so many of us stop learning new skills as adults? Are we afraid to be bad at something? Have we forgotten the sheer pleasure of beginning from the ground up? Tom was inspired by his young daughter's insatiable curiosity and stymied by his own rut of mid-career competence. Tom embarked on a year-long quest of learning purely for the sake of learning. Tom traveled, Tom tried, Tom failed, Tom learned. And uh, it's for that reason that I wanted to talk to Tom today about what his experience was uh, beyond uh, what he shared in his book, Beginners, The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning. Tom is a New York Times bestselling author, has a few books under his belt. He's a visiting scholar at NYU, research fellow at the Canadian Center for Architecture, winner of the Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant. He's written for the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Whit Wilson Quarterly, Travel and Leisure, Rolling Stone, and the New York Times Magazine. Tom's book opens up by saying you must become a beginner. So here's Tom Vanderbilt. Let's bring it in. I guess maybe maybe to start, Tom, uh, what, what made you write the book? Well, it's a good question, Sam, and thanks for having me on the podcast. But, um, you know, I was a uh, sort of, let's say, middle-aged dad and was faced with this situation one day in which I was in a library with my daughter and she wanted to, uh, we were playing a game of checkers and she saw this chessboard nearby and she was quite young and, and it looked intriguing to her because chess like looks kind of cool, right? And she said, can we play that? And I was, I was like, you know, I'd love to, but I actually don't know how. And, and th this was a, you know, sort of horrible thing to have to admit to your daughter, number one, but secondly, as, you know, sort of a, you know, again, kind of a middle-aged person in, in mid-career when you're supposed to be like competent at, at everything, to sort of admit that you actually don't know how to do something uh, is it, hard. So I, I quickly, you know, tried to learn how to play this game and uh, was struggling a bit with it, thought, well, you know, maybe we could, I could use some help. Maybe my daughter could use some help. So I, I hired this coach, which seems kind of, you know, weird for a four-year-old, but that's what parents do nowadays. Uh, and, and I said, can you teach us both at the same time? We'll both be beginners. We'll have all these years between us, but we both want to learn and take on this new thing. And for, for me, it was more than about just wanting to, to learn myself. I, I really wanted to model learning for my daughter. So I think one of the things that happens with, with parents in particular is that, you know, they're, they're often espousing these things that they themselves are not actually, you know, living in their own life, you know, the importance of learning when often they've stopped learning new things. And so I thought, you know, if, if I could see my, if my daughter could see me struggle and, and be sort of bad at something rather than just being this, this figure of constant authority and, you know, om, om, omniscience or so I like to think that, that this would be a benefit. She could see that, you know, you know, everyone struggles, you may have to put in some work, but you probably will get better and here's how to do it. And so, so an experiment was born. And from there, I just went out and wanted to tackle some other things that had long been on, let's say like a life bucket list. And, um, and, and that's kind of where the book took, took root. How, how long did it take you? I mean, it was, it was, you know, kind of several years of just doing the things. And when I say the things, it was ranging from learning how to surf, to sing, to draw, I took a crack at juggling, and and there were there were reasons for doing all these things. But you know, I I didn't want to be like, you know, can I do this in thirty days? I really wanted to sort of take my time with them, and and you know, sort of go through it slowly, see what I could learn about about the process itself, not just not just trying to like, okay, I, I popped up on the board, I surfed a wave, check, that's done, let's move on. You know, I really because the, all these things I picked, you know, and, and like many skills they sort of never end. I mean, you can always 
keep getting better. And there's, there's sort of a progression here and that, and that can get more satisfying the deeper you go. However, it's also very satisfying in the early stages. And this is kind of what I'm obsessed about being a beginner, which I think is such an intoxicating yet nerve wracking condition, especially for adults, many of whom have not been beginners in quite a while, whether in their jobs or in their life, uh, you know, to suddenly have to go back and take a crack at something the way kids do, never having done it before. And you know, you're going to fall, you know, you're going to be embarrassed, uh, but yet the progress is also very fast. You can go from never having skied in your life to after one afternoon becoming a skier. A, not a great skier, let's say, but a skier. And that, you know, that sort of switch from, from verb to noun, like you're skiing, then I'm a skier. That, that's a very powerful thing, I think. And uh, so, uh, so, I, so I, took my, I took my time and then I finally tried to write up the findings. So it was, it was like three years total in answer to your question. <laughs> yeah, I think the one, one of the stories in the beginning uh, that caught my attention and I can totally relate to was the, it sounded like you were, I think, a, a tournament and you were looking around at other parents who uh, sounded like they were either on their phones or sort of checked out from the activities that were happening. And the, in the book, you made the comment, I was like, why, why aren't you playing? Why aren't you practicing? And, you know, my, I have a four-year-old daughter, so I can relate to when you go to the, go to the park or you watch a, a youth sporting event. And again, it's parents are always on the sidelines, just standing there on their phones. Um, so it just like, <laughs> like it was, it was very uh, visual for me. Yeah, and this is something that happens all the time. And I've talked to people, you know, in, in various, I, I met someone who was uh, in the city of um, Fort Worth, Texas, they were doing this Blue Zones program, which was to try to make the whole city healthier. And this woman would go to her soccer, her son's soccer game every week and saw all the parents have these folding lawn chairs. And they're just sitting around the whole time. Meanwhile, the community has some, some health issues. So she says, why don't we go for a walk? That walk started to lead into running. You know, so just this idea, I think something happens with, with parents, you know, we, we, we sort of, or, or let's say middle-aged adults, we sort of give up in a certain sense. We think like, you know, learning is for the young. If we, if we haven't already taken a crack at something, it's too late. We're never going to be great. Uh, so the, the, the impulse is, this is for the kids. Let's just sit on the sidelines. And, and I, you know, I would argue that there's a lot of, of benefit to trying something at any age. And not that you're going to become great at it necessarily, or it's going to become a side hustle or, you know, because I, I certainly don't have the 10,000 hours that is the famously required benchmark for um, achieving mastery in something. I would, I probably had a hundred hours to, to, to take a crack at some of these things, probably less than that for surfing. Um, so, but even in that short time span, there were things that I found immensely satisfying and I think benefited me as a whole. And I think would listeners as well. What, what role did, I'm interested to know, you probably had a lot of different coaches as you went through all these different experiences. What, what stood out to you about uh, maybe the actions or the behaviors of coaches to get the most out of you? What was the most effective? Is there anything that you learned through the experience of the instructor? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I, you know, I would say coaches were, were a hugely important part of this process. There's a you know, nowadays, what, what's interesting about, about the digital culture is that there's a lot that can be learned online, essentially without a coach, by watching videos. And, and humans are quite good at, at imitating other humans. This is essentially one of our, our main learning strategies. And I, I would do that to a certain point, but at some point, you know, a coach is great because often you, you need to see someone, someone needs to see you doing something in real time to provide that feedback. You don't know the mistakes you're making. You don't know what you don't know. Uh, so they're there to, you know, something, something like singing, let's say, this really is a motor skill, but unlike, let's say, learning, a, learning to play tennis or learning to play golf, you don't see the muscles that you're using. You, you don't really know how, what to do with your throat. And, you know, teaching people how to sing is, is a kind of an art and a science, but often, you know, coaches rely on, on very interesting and artful metaphors, you know, like, imagine you're, you know, on top of this fountain of water trying to, you know, uh, because, and that's very effective because you can't just say, okay, you know, compress your diaphragm. And I mean, sometimes they actually do do that also. But um, so apart from the, the feedback, which, you know, is important. And I would say that from the research I saw, positive feedback really has a stronger role than negative feedback because 
people, beginners that usually know what they're doing, they, they know when they've done something wrong and they're probably going to do something wrong more than they're going to do something right. So sort of highlighting those moments when they've done something right, you know, I think really opens the door uh, for progress. So, uh, and then apart from feedback, just the motivational piece I think is huge. And some of the best coaches I had just really, you know, helped instill that desire for me to keep going because that that is part of this this learning thing you know you, you can you, you need the you need the will to show up to want to practice in the off hours and um so I, I i think you know just whether that was from their personality or how they could you know they could show me how i was going to get better because there were there were a lot of moments when i thought i wasn't going to get better and i, I would get really frustrated um the last thing to say about coaches that you know, I've just been reading this in, an, in another new book called uh, The Extended Mind by Annie Murphy Paul, which I actually have uh, right here, The Power of Thinking Outside the Brain. Very, very interesting book. I mean, she talks about one of the ways we learn kind of outside of ourselves is through experts. But one problem with experts, and, and you know, you, you might think that if you want to play, you know, learn to play something, learn to play violin, you know, something like someone like Yo-Yo Ma would be the best person. But and this is where coaches come in, you know, Yo-Yo Ma, so, he, someone might be so good, they don't actually remember what it was like to be where you are. They, they don't, they can't empathize with you, nor can they even explain what they do. So I think what, what a great coach can do is sort of understand what the best performers are doing, but be able to break that down in a way that's digestible to you, often literally breaking it down into, the, into these sort of chunks of information that you can, because, you know, when you're taking something on like surfing, it really is, you know, surfing by numbers. It's, it's the, you, know, you have to do step one, you have to do this. There, there's like 20 steps and you're trying to do all these in your head and it gets, it gets very, very hard. Whereas, you know, Laird Hamilton, he's not gonna remember those steps. He just does it without thinking, it's automatic for him. He can surf the way he breathes. Um, so, so I think coaches provide that nice interface between mastery and, and novice uh, and, and kind of show us the way forward. Yeah. I want to, one of the takeaways, I mean, I took from the book is I've always believed that, you know, you can learn to do anything. Is that, is that the right, is that one of the right takeaways I should have as a reader? Absolutely. I, I you know, I think so. I th something like singing, let, let's start with that. You know, this is something that I think in our culture has become increasingly viewed with a certain almost mysticism, I want to say, where, you know, it's this, it's this God given talent that you were born with that. And, and people then say, I can't sing. And I heard this so often from people. I'm tone deaf. Um, the number of people who actually have this, um, I think it's called, uh, what is it called? A, a musia. Uh, I'm not sure if I have that right, but the, the official phrase for tone deafness is actually really small. Hardly anyone is actually clinically tone deaf. People just, they haven't practiced. They haven't tried to sing. So, you know, how could you be good at something that you haven't tried? You, you wouldn't walk onto a tennis court having not played any tennis and suddenly expect to be good. Uh, so people expect they should, you know, open their mouths and be able to sing. Then when they can't, you know, they get frustrated. So it's, it's a motor skill. It requires, you know, some practice, but just in terms of, you know, let, let's take a simple benchmark, um, staying on, on pitch in tune, which is important in singing. I have a, an app on my phone called Pitch Perfect, which gives you a score of zero to a hundred. And it runs you, it has you sing scales and it gives you this skit, this, this uh, score. So when I started this whole process, I, I was in the fifties, I was really like off pitch, you know, let's say, you know, tone deaf. Um, after a few months of, of hardcore practice, you know, I was in the nineties, sometimes hitting a hundred. So that, that's just a pure, like physical thing. There's a lot more to singing, you know, you have to, there's, there's emotion and expression and all this other stuff. But I, I think, you know, we, we tend to think that you know we we can or can't do it, but what I want what I want to say is that you can do it, and that you'll you will get better at it. It doesn't mean you have to be great, but you can get a lot of enjoyment from that. And I think you know another barrier might be age in people's mind. And I I did things like an open water uh, swimming clinic in in the ocean, in the in Greece and in the Bahamas, and I you know <laughs> I met a. 70 something year old woman on that trip from France who was a lifetime a lifelong smoker actually um you know who had only learned to swim a year before in a pool after watching some YouTube videos and you know I, I you know and she was killing me in the ocean she was fast and and you know I I thought you know what am I doing wrong but and in fact I was doing you know there were things wrong with my stroke but 
you know, the normal reaction from some, for someone in that, in her situation would be, I'm, I'm too old. I've never swum. You know, how could I do this? She didn't listen to that voice. And then, you know, a year later, she was not in this pool, but she was in the ocean, like out in the middle of nowhere with barracudas swimming nearby and just, and just, and just killing it and then looking forward to what her next adventure was going to be. So that I really tried to take that spirit on board as well. In, in the book, and I know because I've read it, but can you mind sharing what the beginner's mind is? Because you do, like, it's a really cool section of the book where you define it. Yeah, I mean, this, this is uh, this concept from Zen Buddhism called uh, Shoshin. And it's, it's this idea, of, you know, of trying to get back to that almost like primal state we, we had as, as children in which our, our minds were free from preconceptions. And, and we had this, this ability to look at the world anew. And I, I think that becomes very difficult when we get older because we, we've, we've just taken so much information on board and basically become set in, many, in our ways, in many ways. And so, you know, how could you instill this, this sense of beginner's mind? Um, you know, people like Steve Jobs have talked about when, when he left Apple, that kind of opened up this portal where he could you could sort of think anew and, and just get out of his old his old habits um, but I think one of the best ways is for the average person is to simply try a new skill because you you are forced to really think of the world differently there's you're, you're suddenly faced with all this 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 new thing you have to do there's there's new equipment there's new vocabulary there's new things you're doing with your body and your brain and the interface there and it just I really, you know, the, the sensation I had over and over again was, and often I was doing this thing with children, what was of, of being a child though, and, and last remembering that kind of, um, you know, those tentative motions. And then, you know, then sometimes we, as adults, we, we go back to things we've once learned as children and that we, it's a form of beginner's mind, you know, it's lurking somewhere in our, our brain that we once knew how to ice skate, but then we get back out there and, you know, you kind of, are wobbly at first and then but but I you know I find this just just a great way to sort of re-energize yourself and also look at the world differently I'm not going to claim that I had any amazing you know breakthroughs by learning to surf but there is some you know I just want to mention some interesting research by uh, Robert Root Bernstein which looked at Nobel Prize winning scientists and he compared that group of people to, science, to, to sort of a regular control group of scientists who had not won the Nobel Prize. And he found that the Nobel Prize winners were more likely to have participated in some kind of amateur pursuit, whether that be, you know, dancing, singing, you know, being a, trying to be a magician. There were a lot of, a lot of things, but the question is, you know, why? And whether that, whether those people were sort of more open-minded and adventurous to begin with, or whether they might have picked up some insight from this this side thing they were doing that they brought back into their research. I mean, there, there could be various explanations, but I find I find that relationship very interesting, and and that's why when people asked, you know, was are you doing this, you know, for for your career? And I was like, well, not really, but but indirectly, maybe so, you know, because you you just never know, and. I think doing some of these things outside of work, even if it doesn't directly benefit your job, it, it benefits you. And there's some interesting research that, you know, you can build up this kind of resilience by doing these things that will then help you navigate, uh, you know, so let's, let's say the, the, the rocky, um, wrong metaphor there, but, you know, some of, some of the waves you encounter, the, the waves you, you sort of conquer in surfing might help you, you know, sort of navigate some of the waves you find in, in your career, to, to put it bluntly. Yeah, I just see so many parallels to the book, to this, like, moment right now where you have so many folks that are out of work, coming back to work, um, companies restarting, they're thinking about how they don't, how they don't just re-onboard employees that maybe worked for them months ago, but reskill because work maybe the job people are coming back to is changing you know, so that that was when when uh, I thought about talking with you that was like that's what was running through my head because in so many ways for if you're a company that wants to restart right now you have to have a beginner's mind in order to get the most out of your people um, any 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 advice to build on for talent leaders out there is you know um, on that point I, I mean it's hard for me to you know I would just kind of go back to, to that basic message of, you know, I, I think this is one of the reasons why it's so important to keep 
to keep this, to, to, to harness this beginner's mindset so you can navigate these things. I mean, we've all, I mean, not even just going back to work, but going back to, to society, knowing how to interact with people face to face is, you know, we're all going through this um, sort of interesting moment. And I mean, one of the, one of the great things I think about the, the pandemic, and that sounds like a strange sentence, but I, I think, you know, because so many of our, our habits were interrupted in a massive way, people suddenly you know, couldn't go to work, they were at home, they couldn't do a lot of the things they normally like to do, that you know, this disruption from external disruption forced habit change. Because you know, habit change is very hard, but one of the ways that it often does happen is by changing the context. And we all had our context pretty radically changed, which is what I think you saw during the pandemic. It wasn't just that maybe some people had some free time, but they suddenly you know, were forced to look at things differently and you, you found, you know, all kinds of things happening, not, not just people pivoting in their careers or, or taking up new careers. There's just an article in the paper about all the, the star bakers that emerged, um, people that were like actors and things and suddenly got into baking. Uh, you know, but things like guitar sales were off the charts. A any form of learning enterprise out there had a very good year because suddenly people were interested in, in tackling this thing. So, you know, I, obviously the, the pandemic was a, a great negative event, but the, the one positive we could take out of this, I think, is that it did, for many people, you know, encourage that kind of uh, taking up that beginner's mindset when they might not have thought to do so in their normal life. Yeah. What was the, what was the hardest? I bet you probably get this question a lot. What's the hardest? Uh, what was the hardest thing to learn? <laughs> um, well, you know, I think in, in a physical sense, it, it would be surfing because surfing really is a lifetime thing that it really helps if you're growing up in Hawaii as a kid to take it on board as a, as a 40 something, 50 something, just getting your body to move in that way and overcome some of the fear is very difficult. But I, I think overall, uh, something like singing was was actually, you know, the most daunting because th this is something that, you know, when scientists have wanted to study uh, the concept of embarrassment and they want to make people embarrassed, you have this question, how can we get people to be embarrassed? They often have them sing in public. This, this is like the most terrifying thing for many people. Uh, and it was for me as well. So I, I think overcoming that was probably a greater hurdle than, than the physical challenge of, of surfing. And I think, interestingly, there's, thinking of companies, there's, you know, some, some vocal leaders out there, some choir leaders who run seminars that, that are, are, I think, are very powerful tools for, you know, kind of work companies running off sites, bringing 15 or 20 people together over the course of a day and trying to get them to sing a couple of songs as a group. I mean, this is, number one, it, it really gets you out of your comfort zone, gets everyone out of their comfort zone. And I think, sort of reshuffles the deck in a way and you have, you know, sort of the manager, you, you might, you might have someone who's, you know, much lower down in the totem pole, but ha actually turns out to have this amazing singing ability. So you, you, it lets, allows people to shine in a different way. And, and I think the, the, the act of, of singing, you know, literally in harmony is one of the most powerful sort of social glue mechanisms there is. You're, you're, you're really exposing your own vulnerability in front of, your friends or, or coworkers, and I think that you know people just number one have fun with it, but really come th through that. I think, and, and they can kind of go back and, and think about that that kind of great sense of camaraderie, and, and it, it's such a powerful emotional moment that it, I think it really lives on as a memory because the brain you know tends to encode those sorts of things a lot more strongly. So I, I would recommend any company out there to to try one of these you know group singing exercises. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna. I'm going to definitely look that up. My team's in trouble would be uh, that's a great idea. Uh, la last question. I'm interested in also as, as a parent uh, going through the, you know, this exercise and writing the book, how has it changed you as a parent, as you uh, interact with your daughter, I believe, right? Yes. Um, it, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, it, you know, it, it's, and, and of course, you know, kids, Kids change, of course, they, they develop and they, you know, it, I say this because my daughter is now in the tween years and it's harder, she has developed a lot more autonomy. So it's harder for her to, to get her to immediately be my sidekick and everything. And that, that was one of the goals of this whole project was, if I could speak bluntly, is that some things I wanted to do and I wanted to have someone there with me and also 
do parenting at the same time. So I think this is a win-win for all parents to, to do things with your kids, to, to learn new things with your kids. And, and as I kind of mentioned earlier, it allowed her to see me in a new light as, as you know, kind of this, oh, I, I can struggle also with something, even though I'm a grown up. But it also allowed, you know, me to see her in a new light. Because often, you know, we drop our kids off at some class or school, and we don't really know what their learning process is like. We don't know what their true strengths are in that environment. But when you're, when you're trying to learn something with your kid, you, you see that happening right in front of you. And when they actually get better than you in a, in a short time, as my daughter did in chess, that, you know, that's very humbling. So it definitely, you know, and I think that is one of the great things about being a beginner also is that it, it creates this, this sense of empathy and it, it makes you a more empathic person, you know, because once you've gone through that and you know how hard it is, maybe you get better, then you look at the people around you that are just starting and you, you can actually feel like, ah, I know what you're going through, man. I went through that myself. And, you know, um, so I think that rather than being just that, that parent that's, you know, has very high expectations, even though they've never done the thing that they want their kid to excel at, uh, now, I'm, now I can understand a little bit better and have more empathy toward, you know, what her particular struggles might be. Um, and I, so I think it's, you know, perhaps just kind of deepened our relationship and made me a more uh, empathic parent, if, if that's a, a thing. But. <laughs> great. Tom, great to meet you and thanks for taking the time. Hey, Sam, thanks a lot. In the beginning of the book, Beginners, Tom said this, in the beginning of a love affair, we're in what has been called an extreme neurobiological state. Stick with me for a second. The brain is jacked on a supersized, hypercaffeinated energy drink of dopamine and stress hormones, the good kind. Our language often reverts to a fragile, childlike babble as if we're born anew. It will all eventually calm down, saying learning a new skill is curiously similar. Your brain is in a state of hyper-awareness, bathing in novelty, and almost overwhelmed as it tries to understand why the three-point shot you just unleashed and thought was perfect was actually an air ball. He goes on to say in Zen Buddhism, there's a state is referred to as a beginner's mind where your mind is ready for anything, open to everything. And in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, while in the expert's mind, there are few. I enjoyed my conversation with Tom. Uh, it was pretty cool to hear his journey and his story. Today, more than ever, we need more beginners. We need organizations to lean in to a beginner's mindset, not just with new workers, not just with new hires, not just in onboarding, but with every worker who's going to be constantly moving, evolving, changing, adapting to new roles in the future of work. So thanks, Tom, for joining me on this episode of Bring It In. If you haven't already, head on over to your local bookstore and pick up Beginners, The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning. That's Beginners by Tom Vanderbilt. Now, back to work. Thank you.